political economic development which have marked the global world in recent years have reignited a new consciousness as to how to define a new world order and chart more constructive ways of fixing it uh, then uh, rather than hang on uh, the blame game or the gap uh, uh, criticisms uh, health hazards especially coronavirus with its uh, adverse effect military coups especially in africa climate change among others have brought about stagnation and and a great discrepancy among world nations with the uncertainty that has been a cause as a result of the crisis in all dimension there is need to chart a recovery route to peace and stability around the world of course global or international cooperation has been a character conversant with the changes that have occurred in the global world especially around political economic lines there is need to reboot global cooperation how this can be done is an area of interest for today a new world order is imperative however to solve international problems especially along lines of balance of power and of course global institutional design what can be done to fix the world to bring a common solution to the problems affecting the global world at large this is the pan african debate Common, uh, a common problem uh, warrants a common solution. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure having you just there on uh, the uh, Pan African uh, uh, Television African Media, and we're on the platform, the Pan African Debater, a program, uh, a two hour program dedicated to talk about uh, issues affecting not just the African continent but the global world at large. And that is why today we are looking at global cooperation that has been entrapped or hijacked due to their uh, development uh, in the world along political lines, along economic lines. Like I said already, a common problem warrants a common solution. So today we are looking at how the geoeconomics, geopolitical uh, crisis or uh, games around uh, the world at large has affected global economic and then we've seen humanitarian crisis. So we have seen uh, uh, that the global world is uh, uh, actually suffering from the ripple effects of uh, these uh, tensions uh, which are mounting, which are looming around the world. But then, like we said in the preamble, we should move from the era of criticism to an era of constructive uh, discussions uh, to see how they can fix the world and bring it back uh, to the right uh, trajectory. Uh, you are welcome again. This is the Pan-African debater. Uh, without actually wasting time, let's uncover the great panel that is with us today uh, to give for more insider to bring constructive analysis to this topic today which says global cooperation uh, go global cooperation is at stake as uh, uh, geopolitical tensions increase among nations of course uh, very feasible in contemporary uh, so society and today uh, I start introducing the panel by uh, uh, recognizing the lone lady in the house uh, Yulia Berg joining us from uh, uh, Russia she's a political uh, scientist hello to you Yulia it's a pleasure having you again uh, the pan-african debate hello good, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me here it's a pleasure to have you share your views, give your own uh, opinion or analysis regarding uh, uh, the common problem that the global world is uh, facing uh, to the United Kingdom. Let's say a warm welcome to Clinton Ellis. He's a geopolitical analyst and also electric car power engineer. Hello to you, sir. A pleasure having you.
Um, hi, Clarice. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to participate in this very, very important um, conversation today. It's very important to talk uh, about such things uh, that will bring results to the problems affecting the global world. And uh, welcoming for the first time on the Pan-African television, Afric Media is Professor uh, Jack Dishkatri, uh, Global Challenges and uh, Opportunities. He's joining us live from India. Hello to you, Professor. A pleasure having you on the Pan-African debate this day. Namaskar. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, it's my proud privilege to be a part of this uh, illustrious uh, discussion uh, on a very relevant theme uh, that is uh, uh, for the global cooperation in the uh, view of the perpetual crisis that we are having. So thank you very much. And uh, I am especially thankful that uh, I am on uh, African uh, TV because uh, I have a special place for Africa in my heart. Uh, by the way, let me uh, just inform, I am a fellow member of uh, one institute, IIPM, at Abuja in Nigeria, and where I have conducted uh, online training programs also for them. So it's, it's my really uh, pleasure and privilege to be on this panel. Thank you. Thank you too. We are glad to have you this day to share your expertise, to share your own opinion uh, regarding the challenges faced by the global world at large. And of course, uh, we're going to the United States of America. We're meeting Dr. Eddie Eric. He's a program officer at Solidarity Center, Africa Department. Hello to you, Dr. Eddie. A pleasure always having you. Please, can you hi, switch Clarice. on your mind? Thank you. Uh, hi to all the uh, co-panelists. Some uh, I uh, met uh, already, and uh, welcome our professor from uh, India. I believe uh, it is uh, a true manifestation of uh, some of the visions that the uh, founding fathers of um, India uh, held to their heart with the non-alignment movement, and we know the role that you know India played into that. So. Uh, I'm pleased to be here as well, uh, Clarice. It's a pleasure having you, Dr. Adi. It was a pleasure having you all uh, to accepting to share your opinion, uh, what you think about uh, the unfoldment around the global world. Uh, coming back, uh, uh, before we go to our analysis, let's remind our televiewers that uh, this is the Pan-African Debate uh, running on Afric Media TV. And you can follow us via Facebook, uh, Afric Media TV. Leave your comments. Uh, what do you think? How can the fix the world, especially uh, uh, policymakers, those trying to uh, uh, bring a new world order? We have seen the ripple effect. So how can we fix this? Coming to you, uh, dear Yulia, uh, let's first of all have a, a general uh, view of our topic today uh, on global cooperation, uh, bringing to a clearer understanding of what global cooperation is and why is it necessary uh, to maintain such in order to fast track uh, maybe uh, economic uh, development around the world? Um, well, <laughs> when we talk about global uh, cooperation, if we want to mean uh, cooperation between different actors around the globe, it's one thing. But when we talk about global cooperation under um, let's say um, under the command of a, of a certain group that just pulls the strings um, it's a different thing and here the key point is sovereignty you cannot be talking about any real global cooperation when the actors in this process are not sovereign enough to make their own decisions on how they want to trade, how they want to build economic relations, how they want to build their security architecture how they want to structure their lives, which kind of values they want to uh, maintain in, in their countries or spread around. And those fundamental issues like, um, you know, values, security, um, uh, economic principles, and sovereignty as an ability to make own decisions on that are key for uh, real global cooperation, because otherwise, we will continue seeing um, a scenario developing 
when you have a certain group of uh, people, the so-called, um, you know, global elites, or it's, well, basically an international group of major um, capital holders, let's say the ones running uh, the biggest companies, etc. So it's not even, um, you know, located geographically somewhere in one place, but again, it's a network. But when you see this group um, uh, pulling the strings and saying, okay, you know, like some time ago it happened, let's move the production to China. Let's not pass the technologies to them. Let's, uh, let's uh, you know, just pass uh, the tasks on, on what is supposed to be uh, produced and in which uh, quantity. And then we will be setting prices for that. We will be putting our labels for that and we will be making our billions on that. So that's how it's been working, um, you know, in terms of, you know, production of the majority of the goods uh, the customers are enjoying um, all over the world. So to have uh, a, an actual global cooperation in the first place, uh, what you need to have is sovereignty. Once you have sovereignty, you can come to that open global market and say, all right, here is what I have. You know, I have natural resources, I have human capital, I have great creative specialists, and, you know, let's see how we can exchange that to what we need, right? Not to mention other possible um, scenarios where we can have, where we can recognize uh, some of the rights of each uh, human being, each citizen of this planet for the resources that the planet has. Because with the technology we have right now and with the, uh, hopefully with the understanding we have right now, we can realize that, you know, nation states and borders are quite an artificial uh, concept. So. Uh, to a certain extent, each individual on this planet is supposed to be able to enjoy the, uh, uh, you know, the, the resources that are available. But that's uh, a different conversation. I don't think that would be possible in the upcoming future. Um, but in any case, when we talk about global cooperation, again, uh, the key point here is sovereignty. Otherwise, it will be global domination versus global uh, um, um, you know, support of that system, if that's vocal or not, but if uh, you have um, actors being a part of that system, it means that they support it either silently or by um, their um, actions. Yulia, uh, coming to you, Mr. Elisa, uh, we, we've seen her uh, listen carefully to Yulia Burke giving her an uh, insight on what uh, she thinks global cooperation is all about. Then I, I, I want us to actually shift from that. But now let's see. Uh, now the world seems to, to be divided uh, along geopolitical and geoeconomic lines. And today we are looking at how this is actually uh, uh, bringing stability stagnation as far as uh, this global cooperation is concerned how can we analyze this and what are the stakes involved uh thanks Clarice, and and um thanks to yulia for introducing the idea of sovereignty because unless an individual or a country or or you would say have the ability to analyze um all the facts and then make a decision um in their interest, they're unable to uh, manifest sovereignty. And, and, and I believe in terms of the, 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 the nature of the cooperation that is required in order to manifest um, the world that most of the humans want, which is a, hu which is a world um, that we share the resources and we enjoy. Each individual has the right to aspire, to improve himself, to acquire through his, his talent, his, 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 his freedoms, um, to expand himself and have that opportunity to do so. So what I do believe is that in order to create this reality, we have to, in, in just following up from what Yuli has said, is that um, the blockchain um, in terms of governance structure is required. And what that has is that it has, every node is equal, right? They have the same amount of votes, right? And, 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 and secondly, um, every node knows what the other nodes know, and each individual node come together through a consensus mechanism to verify and validate the information that is presented to them, and then through that mechanism, make a decision in their interest accordingly, through agreement, not through coercion, not through control. And the, 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 the two realities that we see emerging that you, you, you mentioned in, in your question 
is that we have a, a, the concept of globalization on one hand, in which you have you know the Davos elite who decide um, the rules, what the rules for the rest of the world and all the world should be. And as Yulia is saying, these people are not living in any particular country because their power is offshore. And, and we're talking about people like George Soros, and we're talking about um, elites who created these ideas of the grand chessboard of Brzezinski, who wanted to chop up the, 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 the globe in spheres of influence and understood that if you controlled certain spheres of influence geopolitically, you would then have the advantage to control the world through geopolitical, through trade, through you know, trade agreements and, and economic you know, inter integration. And the economic integration that we've seen in the topology of globalization, what that has created is a global elite, as what Putin says, that the moment a president gets elected, he's visited by men in black suits with a suitcase. And these are the bureaucrats. These bureaucrats have been around, and Kennedy talked about them in his speech. And this is why Kennedy was assassinated, because he said the idea of freedom and secrecy are antithetical. And so when you create an entity like the CIA, like the military industrial complex that is able to grow and to control extraordinary amounts of money in the budget, they can then go around the world in, in, and subterfuge and sabotage, you know, the ambitions of sovereign states, and that is what we have seen in the 1960s with, you know, you know Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Kroma, those, you know, African leaders that really wanted to have sovereignty and to express and to manifest the ambitions of the citizens of these countries. And so, what we're seeing is the emergence of independent states. So the people have cried for this in the form of Brexit. And the, they, they rejected the, the bureaucracy and the control mechanisms of Brussels, who wanted to make every European country the same, every country as a McDonald's, every country as a Burger King, and what it means is liberty and freedom. Every country you know, it takes on this extraordinary, like crazy ideas of um, changing your sex, changing your identity, no longer male or female. In other words, destroying the very foundation of what it is to be human. And, and, and the people have rebelled in, in the form of um, Donald Trump. And Trump came to office and of course he shook, you know, the apple carts and everything started to fall apart. And this bureaucracy that has been hidden is now manifesting itself in the, in the face of the population to see. And of course they can call them the global cabal, you can call them, you know, the bankers or whatever you want to call them. But these individuals, they command extraordinary power through the economic and financial systems. And we're talking about Davos in particular, Klaus Schwab types of individuals. So this battle that we're seeing for freedom, the ability to govern your own self sovereignly and to control your own resources of your own country so that the people of your country can then um, enjoy the wealth and, and the abundance of, of, of the earth together as, as one. And, and the people are rebelling against it in the form of the BRICS. And we will talk about this in, in, in my next um, in a con part of my conversation. But it's, it's really about cooperation in sovereignty, not in oppression. Thank you. This cooperation in sovereignty in NOTA, uh, in uh, operation, uh, coming to you, uh, Professor uh, Jagdish Katria, uh, we listen uh, to uh, Lisa outlining very important points and of course highlighted the, the, the fact of the quest uh, of controlling a sphere of influence and, and that's why uh, what has heightened the geopolitical uh, game uh, around the world. But then uh, we see that this move alone has uh, hijacked uh, this global uh, global cooperation and you, we, we know some of the uh, effects of it coming to the United Nations uh, that has always been talking about a sustainable and inclusive development but then today we see nations, we see countries separated along uh, uh, political lines, uh, uh, economic lines, but then uh, there's this great divergence between the rich and the poor, and this, of course, so these are some of the uh, criticisms of of this global cooperation. So, what have you to say uh, regarding this? Thank you, thank you very much, madam, and 
my greetings to all co-panelists also. Uh, yes, we all agree, as uh, Julia Madam has said, and uh, uh, Dr. Clifton, uh, we are in a state of transformation. Uh, the world is uh, changing. Change is always a constant thing, but the pace of change that is taking place now uh, is much greater and uh, almost becoming unmanageable. And that is why we need a cooperation at global level. You see, we have had uh, several crises in quick succession. Uh, economic slowdown, then COVID pandemic at global level, and now the wars going on and civil wars in several places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, in my view, uh, as uh, Dr. Clifton mentioned, we have to be uh, see the crisis as an opportunity for rebuilding our vision, rebuilding our policies, rebuilding our societies, and uh, that is what uh, we should take this as an opportunity. And I am happy that such discussions are being uh, held uh, to formalize a way uh, to this transformation. Now, just see that the world order is changing from unipolar to multipolar world. Now, it's no more a uh, unipolar world or even bipolar world now. And uh, there are aspirations of even emerging economies uh, to take uh, lead in their own way in shaping the world. And we, we cannot deny them these powers, uh, their rightful place in the comity of nations. And this is the biggest challenge, that uh, there is a sort of, uh, what I call is, it's a leadership deficit uh, that we are facing in the world because the so-called uh, uh, world leaders, uh, uh, self-proclaimed world leaders also, they have not been coming uh, to the help of humanity whenever a crisis comes. India uh, produced uh, billions of and uh, billions of vaccines at, uh, when the pandemic is struck. But uh, this is the way that uh, a global challenge has to be made at global level, keeping the whole humanity in mind. You see, very soon we are going to have 8 billion people, maybe by next month itself, on this planet, 8 billion. And we have the challenge is that we, we must offer them a peaceful living. We have to offer them education, housing, food, shelter, everything. And that is the biggest challenge. And uh, as Julia Madam mentioned, that you cannot compromise uh, sovereignty. And uh, you see, you see uh, so far, what has been happened is that uh, one size fits all kind of economic policies have been thrust upon uh, nations uh, to follow. And uh, we, we are seeing the result uh, that is there. So, uh, in fact, uh, that is why we need freedom to design our own future, freedom to design our own policies that suit us. The applicability of policy has to be localized. So we have to have a global vision, but local action also. You see, uh, and we cannot have uh, with these kind of policies, what has happened is that there have been islands of uh, uh, prosperity around the world. Some few companies taking over uh, all the riches of the uh, world. So uh, we cannot have that uh, islands of uh, uh, prosperity and uh, we call them development. No. You see, if we are having 8 billion people uh, very soon on this planet, and now just uh, take it as a, uh, every human body has billions of cells. Now, even if one cell in the body is feeling a pain, the whole body has reaction on it. And similarly, even if one small country is facing problems in the world, the whole world has to see it as their own problem, as a global problem. And that is what has to be seen. So we have to have a system of not only cooperation, but collaboration in solving the global issues. So that is my initial comment, and we'll come later on about the opportunities and how we can uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you for that, uh, Professor Jagdish. Uh, coming to you, uh, Dr. Adi, we continue in the same perspective. Uh, if we are today talking about global cooperation being at stake, it's because uh, the world is already uh, affected uh, by uh, what is happening uh, in uh, the global world because uh, when we talk about being, we're looking at how it is challenging international peace and stability and that's why we're here today so what do you think in your own perspective how can this global cooperation be fixed in such a way that we can uh, have this uh, uh, global or international peace and stability and enjoy the positive aspect that comes with globalization or inter-country uh, relationship? I believe that uh, I want to start with uh, a uh, statement by uh, our own Dambisa Moyo a few years ago when she was uh, discussing the uh, West uh, reaction to uh, China's increasing, and not only China, but uh, the BRICS countries in the world increasing presence. Uh, in Africa, for instance, Dambisa Muyu made a statement uh, and calling on uh, superpowers, if you want, to make uh, the difference between uh, cooperation and uh, competition. And of course, she chose the way of uh, cooperation. And I believe that uh, I want to buttress that uh, uh, as well, understanding that, you know, I am on the side of all of those uh, leaders who believe that. Uh, as human beings, and uh, our brother from uh, India uh, mentioned, uh, regardless of the color of the skin that we have, we are all uh, created with the same, uh, should I say the same kind of genes, and we all have uh, the same motto as a human beings, which that, uh, by the way, is the reason why uh, the promoters of international institutions like the United Nations or even international uh, mechanism like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights always, you know, will posit uh, the importance of human beings, not uh, uh, defining or making a difference between who is from India, who is from here, but it is us as human beings. So I believe, um, uh, Clarice, uh, to uh, make it very short and quick on that first question, what is at stake in here for me uh, is the viability, the credibility, and the sustainability of uh, these international institutions that uh, we, we meaning here, uh, the world political actors, have uh, put in place to avoid the world to uh, uh, facing what we witness uh, uh, during the first world war during uh, the war uh, between 1939 and 1945 the united nations for instance as the, the main institution that came out of this effort of a cooperation with all its uh, different branches uh, was given the mandate the mandate i'm sorry to maintain peace in the world but that mandate to maintain peace in the world include also addressing poverty addressing climate change, addressing uh, the uh, impact of the technological revolution today on our environment, include uh, deforestation, include uh, facing the different pandemic that you know what we face in the world, the communicable you know, diseases, for instance. Where are we today in doing all this? And the uh, gist of all of this uh, is actually what uh, our sister from Royal Shia uh, uh, mentioned, May it be the United Nations in its charter. May it be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. May it be the International Labor Organization. May it be the International Telecommunication Union. You name them all. All of them call for member states based on the notion and the respect of their sovereignty. So I believe that it is key. And what is at stake today actually is again how we are seeing the viability, the credibility, and the sustainability of the international organization that we have today. Are there fits in the world that we are living in today after so many years of true globalization, of true uh, presence of, uh, 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 I mean, digital presence? Are they strong and robust enough to lead us in a way? Or are we facing a new place where the countries of the South, which also do have an opportunity in here probably to renew and strengthen their South-South cooperation to have a sovereign influence, 
or not the world stage. For me, these are the different uh, elements that you know we have at stake today, uh, Clarice. For that, uh, how sustainable, how viable, and what is the credibility of uh, this uh, corporation? Uh, thank you. Uh, just to remind you, joining us, that it is the Pan African Debater uh, on uh, Pan African Television and Freak Media. You can drop your comments uh, via Facebook. What do you think about uh, the global corporation that has been interrupted uh, by uh, the uh, unfoldment uh, around the world, especially in uh, along political, even economic? lines uh, uh, that's what we hear uh, come uh, to discuss today uh, coming back to you uh, Yulia Berger uh, we have listened to all the the, 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 the analysis uh, coming from the gentlemen and of course from you uh, let's continue to to, to say that uh, uh, policy makers like we put it on uh, uh, super pass around the world when making our uh, drafting policies the pressure the the, the, the dogma of uh, uh, equality uh, human rights but then uh, the coming of the coronavirus uh, and the of course uh, uh, the, the, the 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 crisis uh, between Ukraine and Russia are some of the examples that have shown uh, that uh, there is more of uh, the, the quest uh, for interest uh, great than uh, a common a common uh, 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 or maybe it they don't work in unison with uh, the, the, the the policies uh, put in place uh, since that the crisis in the world have exposed these lapses how can we uh, uh, change the narratives or reverse this to make sure uh, that the world at large benefits, uh, like we uh, said, from the resources, from the endowment, uh, and of course from this win-win uh, cooperation that is existing among nations? You know, um, when you dive into um, analysis of the current geopolitical events, you can almost drown with the amount of information that is available right now, right? There is so much being said, so much being discussed, so many fakes uh, circulating around. And, you know, when you try to investigate um, and when you actually follow the news, you get informed or, um, well, if you follow the news, you get disinformed by one side or another in, in the most cases, right? If you don't follow the news, you are not even informed. And it's very hard to navigate through, you know, this ocean of information that we're seeing, especially when you talk about um, different political leaders. And um, the trick over here is also that in many cases, one uh, one little fact would be pulled out to prove that a specific political leader is, you know, let's say absolute uh, evil or the absolute good, just based on, you know, some small facts taken out of the context. The point that I'm trying to make here is that what is necessary to analyze uh, if you want to, uh, you know, navigate through uh, this um, amount of information and fakes and, and interpretations and everything, is to see the strategies that are being uh, not just discussed, but actually implemented and the values that underlie those strategies. Because, all right, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to express my personal opinion right now. And, you know, that one could agree or disagree with that. Um, yet, I think there should be, uh, you know, um, some rational limits put on uh, things that are being promoted in many cases under the flag of freedom and democracy. And when you see the extremes to which some of the liberal communities go, when everything is confusing, I mean, you don't even know how to address a person unless he puts a small beige on, on him or her or whatever else itself, you know? And uh, in my opinion, this is crazy, but to be able to distinguish uh, which side you want to somehow support or where you want to uh, give your own um, energy and, you know, resources and everything else, is to see, is it generally speaking for the evolution? Is it for something constructive? Is it for life itself or is it not, right? Because when you see um, this kind of conflict uh, that we're facing right now, basically it's a conflict between uh, postmodernism and uh, this one has been this side has been represented by uh, liberal democracies and their uh, you know extreme avant-garde i would say 
that is very confused about uh, its own gender, its own, uh, you know, values, its own um, ability or desire to even live on this planet. Because what you see happening is, you know, legalization of euthanasia for everyone. Now it's being discussed that poor people could also have the right to leave this, um, you know, life uh, upon uh, their own decision. There is, in my opinion, but again, this is just my personal opinion, too much confusion in that. On the other side, you have traditionalism. And the danger over here as well is that when you have too much pressure coming from one side, let's say from the postmodernists, the traditionalists would be going you know, deeper to fundamentals, which is also an extreme that is definitely not good for anyone. But the balance point here is always shifting because as years go by, and now it's happening very fast, through the window of Overton, we find ourselves accepting more and more of things that we used to consider, we as humanity used to consider nonsense for many centuries, if not, you know, thousands of years. So when when we follow, um, you know, the, the, the narratives, when we um, try to navigate through the narratives, I think the key decision that we need to make is what we stand for. And we need to uh, be able to be vocal about it. Because right now, uh, you know, I feel like in some communities, uh, it's not even comfortable to say that you uh, believe in two genders, <laughs> and not more than that, like, why not four, you know, people would ask you. But it's not even comfortable, and you need to excuse yourself if you want to say something like that. And that as well <laughs> is a nonsense. So now we're seeing more and more discussions of, all right, you know, let's uh, start accepting this and that and whatsoever and erase all the uh, borders. And basically, it's it's the narrative that we see promoted right now by the postmodernist society goes against the laws. I don't want to talk about religious issues now, but against the loss of the universe, because I mean, it was not us who created the uh, the universe, and it has been working in a certain way for, you know, millions of years. So who are we with our limited knowledge and, you know, with lettuce overliving some of our political uh, leaders, who are we to get into uh, those core issues, like trying to get and change, get into and change the DNA? trying to play games, you know, with um, our bodies at this, uh, you know, genetic level, trying to play with our minds at those crazy levels when the key objective is to get people as confused as possible when you don't even know what you are and what you're doing. So to change the narrative, uh, responding to your question, you know, uh, briefly and concluding, um, I think that to change the narrative, we need to first look into our own selves and it's it's something we need to decide not with the brain because it plays plays too many mind games right now but we need to look into our hearts and see what do we need to do to live the life to evolve and to pass our knowledge on to the next generation one one way or another because that's that's the key objective of uh, you know the uh, you know, the life itself that's how evolution has been working so you know if something is is um about dividing conquering if something is about destruction and self-destruction and degradation moral degradation uh, degradation of values then i think it is doomed to die off but while it's dying uh it might take a lot of people with it and this is exactly what we see happening right now Data and uh, the goal uh, as we're here today is to talk constructively to see that we mitigate the uh, uh, the, 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 the effect uh, of, of the crisis uh, to ensure that, that uh, many people, especially the innocent ones, do not suffer the burns of what is occurring uh, along uh, political lines across uh, the, the world at large. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Elise, uh, let's continue in the same perspective uh, with uh, Yulia. She made mention and, of course, pointed out the media. This is something we were supposed to come uh, to in the course of the program. But then uh, let's just uh, try to look at it. With all the happenings around the world, the media, 
let's look at the role of the media in trying to quell this uh, uh, this tension or to reduce the tension uh, that has affected uh, the uh, uh, international cooperation, especially as the, the nation is witnessing a hike or an increase in the geopolitical activities and geoeconomic activities in Africa and beyond. So how can we in this present context uh, 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 use the media or how can the media help to change the, the narratives in the world by bringing more constructive and objective analysis regarding the world's uh, problem rather than what we have, uh, the, the issue of uh, propaganda, uh, one party inciting the other. How can we avert this to ensure that we bring a solution to the problems faced by the world? Thank you, Clarice, uh, for this beautiful question. Um, also, thank you to Julia for that um, uh, introducing the human element into this conversation, because at the end of the day, we're not numbers, we're humans. And we were, we are created beings. Some would have you believe that somehow we just came out of nowhere. But understanding the deeper meaning of life requires you to know yourself. And that's the fundamental question in Greek philosophy. And of course, if you look across the world, the democratic system that you see, demokratia, um, is actually coming, emanating out of, of, of Greek, um, say, civilization. So these ideas and understanding requires us to know ourselves, who we are, what we are, and where we are from. You know, this civilization here is only 200 years old. It's not old. And 200 years in the grand scheme of things is a very short time. So it's important to integrate the area under the curve over a longer period of time to understand what we are. And there are those with these insane ideology um, that would want to stop us from having conversations like these. Because it is having conversations like these that we expose the fraud. And um, freedom of speech is absolutely sacrosanct and it's required in order for us to expose the corruption. Barack Obama um, passed a law in the U.S. legalizing propaganda. He passed a law, I'm going to repeat that so that our audience can really think about this. Barack Obama passed a law that would make it legal for the American government to propagandize onto the population. There is a, you talk about the media and what part the media can play. Let's go back to um, Operation Mockingbird. Operation Mockingbird was an operation by the CIA that effectively actively infiltrated the media. And uh, when they were asked in an open forum um, in, 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 in the Senate, or I think it was Congress, they asked um, the C a representative of the CIA, do you have operatives in the media? And he didn't want to say. He says, yes. He, he eventually said, I want to talk to you in a more secret environment to divulge what beautiful ideas we have about <laughs> infiltrating the media. This is absolute corruption. That is why there is the First Amendment, which is the right to free speech. And political speech is protected constitutionally. In other words, I have the right to say anything that I want to say as long as I'm not defaming anybody, I'm not inciting hate, right? These are the preconditions to free speech because free speech is also responsible but the people that are actually trying to curtail your speech they have their own value system and their value system is based on that we're not human we we can just easily go from sex to sex and, and all the rest of it and you know it's a it, it's it's whatever you want you think that you are you are and they have completely removed the conversation from the realms of that which is rational and they want this insanity to permeate every part of society and they want to teach this in school to brainwash the mind for young and they want us to sit still and, and idly by and watch you know this corruption as if nobody knows what they are and who they are and this is really the foundation of, of the conversation that we're having um the media has an absolute responsibility in facilitating the truth and what we have is not the media anymore the centralized media that is dying and Trump accurately calls it fake news. It is now, nobody's watching CNN. 
because the cat is out the back. These individuals do not represent, you know, the actual, the, 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 the true representation of whatever narrative it is that they're creating. They create their narratives because they want a psychological operation to change the minds of the people that would legitimize, you know, um, say military actions, for example. They, they, Gaddafi wanted to launch the gold standard. And they told the people Gaddafi was this evil megalomania individual that justified destroying the most prosperous country in Africa. This is the kind of lies that they teach. And they, they do so because they want the population to agree and to, and to vote with their, with their emotion, to vote you know, with this lie as their belief system so they would justify violence against the rest of the world. And so the media is bought and paid for. It's bought and paid for by the petrol dollar. The petrol dollar has been an instrument of war against the population of the world since 1972 when it was launched by Nixon. They removed the gold standard. Gaddafi wanted to reintroduce the gold standard because it is only through monetary sovereignty that you are able to really, really exercise your freedom. The idea of freedom without economic and monetary sovereignty is 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 complete ridiculous. And just in 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 in, in closing here, is that the BRICS and the BRICS plus that is emerging represents. 42% of the world. The original BRICS represents 42% of the world and significant portion of the global economy. So this is not just some you know, fringe movement we're talking about. We're talking about a significant proportion of humanity that has had enough with the petrodollar and the SWIFT system that has been used as instruments of, of warfare, economic warfare against the population of the world. Biden went to Saudi Arabia recently to beg Bin Salman to increase production of oil because he wanted to exchange printed dollar for oil. Bin said, I don't want it anymore. The same thing happened with Schultz. Schultz flew to Canada to speak to um, Trudeau about exchanging, you know, euro for gas. Those days are over. The world has reje is rejecting this fiat artificial corruption called the monetary system that has contaminated and been used as an instrument of war against the population of the world and stealing their wealth from them. And so the emergence of the gold standard, that is through the BRICS and Russia's past, a gold-backed ruble and a gas-backed ruble. And so we talk about the pipeline Nord Stream, and we don't, I'm not going to talk about that now the next, the next time around, but it's absolutely relevant to talk about weaponization of um, the, the monetary and, and macroeconomic system against the people of the world and the media, buying the media with that money. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Lees. Uh, it is imperative, of course, uh, to understand uh, the narratives so you can be able to choose uh, the right uh, media to follow, to inform yourself uh, about the, the unfolding uh, around the world. Uh, coming to you, Professor Daktish, uh, recently uh, in the just concluded United Nations General Assembly, the UN Chief Antonio Guterres uh, uh, pinpointed that uh, there is a great gap or a divergence between uh, the uh, uh, developed world and the developing world. I want us to analyze uh, what has happened to this dogma of uh, humanity of humanity that today we see uh, the uh, develop this gap how can we uh, bridge the gap existing between the developed and the uh, underdeveloped world well thank you madam uh, for that uh, lovely question and uh, thanks to Clifton sir Julia madam and Eddie sir for giving their very good opinions uh, uh, I <laughs> you, you said that a uh, gap between developed and developing. Personally, I would like to ask, is America not developing? Have they stopped developing? Are they fully developed and there is no need for further developing? The whole world is developing world. If you see, till your problems are solved, till each and every individual realizes his or her full potential on earth, we are still in a state of developing. So calling themselves to be developed and uh, others as uh, less developed are developing, uh, 
this is uh, not proper. The gap is between the uh, education level, between the resources availability, and between the attention that you give to certain societies. You see, uh, uh, le since we are talking about uh, on an African channel and uh, with reference to Africa, I would like to mention two facts. If you see Africa, the whole continent is much bigger than India plus China plus whole of Europe. Such a big landmass. It has got 1.3 billion people in Africa. 1.3 billion. And uh, another fact is that 60% uh, of this 1.3 billion population is in young uh, working age population. Where else do you find that? The whole, uh, in the Western world, the population is aging. They don't have uh, manpower. Again, you see, Africa is the land of opportunity for all future generations because it has so vast untapped potential both in production as well as in consumption. The only difference is that we need to uh, upskill the manpower, the young manpower that uh, it has in uh, Africa and uh, utilize their untapped potential for the whole humanity. We need to bridge that digital divide. That is the gap. Certain societies, they are using digital technologies, artificial intelligence, everything to their advantage. But uh, so many others, they don't have even access to it. So uh, this is the gap. And what is the root cause of this is you see, we, we, we could develop a vaccine for so many diseases, for coronavirus also, but friends, there's no vaccine developed so far to combat human greed. There's no vaccine for hatred, for discrimination. And that is what is the, the gap. And uh, this is what is to be removed by promoting uh, uplifting the sections of societies uh, that are underprivileged, that have not been attended to so far, and uh, uh, bring them at par to uh, reduce this gap. And uh, I think uh, there is, uh, as uh, Adisa pointed out, there is uh, uh, enough scope for South-South cooperation also in this. And uh, uh, India uh, is always ready for cooperation with all other countries in, in that matter. And uh, skill development is the need of the hour. And second need is that if you go to the root cause of the problem, why, why we are facing all these problems, the root cause of all this is that there is lack of spirituality, lack of value system, as uh, Clinton Sir mentioned. The, our value system uh, is not teaching us uh, law, it is teaching us hatred, uh, combined with social media, as, as was pointed out early, earlier. So we need to have a correct value system right from childhood, from the school education level. If you grow people, we are, what we are trying to do, we are giving them technical skills to turn them into good human resources. But uh, I would like to say that you cannot be a good human resource until you are a good human being first. And, and that, is what is, that is what is required. And uh, that is the fact uh, uh, that we have that gap we have to fulfill, the gap in values and ethics. Uh, that is my uh, saying at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we go uh, faster to Dr. Edi. Uh, we continue to analyze and look at the impact of what is happening around the world and how it is uh, affecting, of course, uh, uh, international cooperation. Uh, uh, we, we know that uh, the quest uh, by superpower to define or to bring forth a, a new world or a new order, uh, or that has instead uh, strained uh, international relationships. And we know, we see how even the 
African continent is gravely, uh, gravely uh, affected by all of this development. What did uh, actually, uh, what went wrong and how can we fix this to ensure uh, that the economies of countries uh, can bounce back to normal, uh, that they can have a clear uh, trajectory and push forth with their uh, development agendas? The first thing, uh, maybe to a uh, question, is uh, the notion of uh, bringing a new world order. Once again, is that uh, a new world order in which we see more of a uh, cooperation? Or is it a world order that is going to uh, maintain the same status as we see in the world today? In other words, I will looking at the same world order established at the end of the Second World War with the inception of the United Nations. Maybe one of the critical things that we don't do uh, sometimes, I mean, we do, but you know what we are uh, a little bit missing in and here is uh, the structure of the United Nations today. We all remember when the later Boutros Boutros Ghali was uh, the uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, a lot of uh, changes, right, were initiated or were advanced in terms of even the maintenance of a peace in the world, for instance, or uh, the UN changing its mechanism in conflict prevention in a number of countries. But one of the questions that remain on the table still today is the value of the United Nations Security Council. In the world that we live in today, after so many years of creating, should we continue to have a body that has five nations controlling or having the ultimate power to make decisions, whereas the other 188 uh, 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 countries make a decision. It takes only one of those five to go uh, another direction for that law not to go uh, to pass. Maybe the time also has come, especially for the countries of the South, again, in the same vein, the same spirit of what they did, uh, in the 1950s, right, uh, around Nehru and all of these uh, 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 leaders, what can be the new path that you know, we are uh, charting uh, uh, forward? That's number one. Number two, uh, where is this that, you know, uh, the current leading nations of the world are missing the mark, which is uh, creating uh, uh, what we are seeing today? If we take the case of Africa, for instance, the competition that, you know, what we are seeing, when it comes to uh, relations with, uh, with Africa, is at the same time or can be beneficial for uplifting the lives of so many people. And I uh, love what you know, uh, our brothers from uh, India said about, uh, is there any nation in this world that, that has to stop developing? And are the nations that are trailing to achieve uh, that development? The answer to that question very definitely is no. Because even here in the United States, I'm part of the group called the National Digital uh, Inclusion Alliance. It, it is amazing we find out that even in the United States, over 25% of households do not have a clear and stable access to the Internet. And we are living in the United States. Not to talk about you know, what is happening in so many other countries uh, in the world. So the notion of development is uh, ongoing. Because uh, as human beings, we are such are being so endowed with uh, uh, creativity that creation, invention comes a day after day and day after day and year after year. However, what I want to say in closing this uh, 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 question, what is it that you know what has been missed? The question is, what is it that you know we have missed since 1945 that we don't want to change? Listen. President Barack Obama, as a candidate during uh, the uh, 2008 campaign, said something that uh, reverberate and something that you know he himself did not work on. In uh, Germany, as a candidate, he said this, that he was in Berlin, that the Berlin Wall crumbled down, symbolizing a change in the world order. But at the same time, many other wars went back up. What are those walls that you know what we've been witnessing till today? It is the wall, or they are the walls of uh, religious intolerance, of uh, uh, racism, as the uh, professor mentioned earlier, as the uh, uh, violence against the woman, 
or multiplied ethnicism and another multiplication of other conflicts that actually are separating human beings. Even the walls of migration today. Yes, we talked about uh, free movement of goods, free movement of ideas, but ideas and goods are created by who? By individuals. What is the freedom that they have to move around? So it is not about uh, creating a new world order, but it is uh, the uh, advancement of this high spirit of competition in the world today, I believe, which does not necessarily take into consideration the core values or the uh, interest of the people that we say we want to uplift themselves. Reason why the world today is facing what? A crisis when it comes to uh, uh, health. It's facing a crisis when it comes to uh, jobs. It's a facing a crisis when it comes to uh, education. How many people can have access to a laptop or a computer device when we know that uh, the uh, international organizations even label access to the internet as a human right? How are we working with that human right? And therefore, there are so many things that you know what we have enabled as a human right that nation countries, the states, individuals, institutions, and even us as human beings and social political actors should be working on, yet we are not measuring correctly how we can achieve that. And the crisis that we are mentioning, we talked about the current crisis between Russia and Ukraine, but let us not forget what is engulfing so many African countries today. What is going on in Mali? What is going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo for years, that are over four decades? What is going on in many other parts of the world that you know we are not bringing to light? To what extent the crisis in Ukraine really impacting uh, food production, for instance? Is it right for a head of state in Africa to say that the food prices are increasing in my country because of the war in Ukraine? Or should we say that the uh, food policy economic policy that we put in place that made us dependent on what we should not be dependent on is uh, creating the problem that we have today. And of course, uh, that's where the problematic lies, of course, uh, and that's why uh, we're looking at how these problems can be solved, or what policies, or what policies, what economic policies have leaders put in place to ensure uh, that uh, they do not uh, suffer adversely when uh, uh, a nation uh, that uh, actually the, the corporate with is uh, having some internal problems. Uh, we continue in the same perspective with you. Um, uh, let me start this time around. Uh, with you, uh, Alice Clinton, uh, we continue with the issue of the new world order and how uh, uh, the, the, the policy makers have missed it and it is actually straining and bringing misery uh, to the global world, especially uh, uh, to the, uh, 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 let me say, the vulnerable uh, uh, population. Ellis Clifton, please can you on the mic? You can hear you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eddie. That was beautifully said about um, everything is being blamed on the war in Ukraine. The inflation in Europe, you listen to the politicians' speech, it's the war in Ukraine. The inflation um, in, in Germany, the war in Ukraine. Um, it's like the entire world is taking this specific um, conflict as the, the primary reason for the socioeconomic and political instability in the world. This is a complete um, hoax. And the people of the world need to become aware of it. That The, the point that Dr. Eddie made at the end of that, um, uh, uh, his, his, his contribution there just now is the primary reason. If you go back to 1994, that was NAFTA was signed into into law by bill clinton and if you read noam chomsky's um book he will where he writes about what really took place before and after was was signed the workers union had no opportunity to read the repercussions of nafta the exportation of jobs overseas and that was the laying of the the, the foundation for all the multilateral agreements that were then signed you know, into law in the different um, countries of the world to somehow ship across 
their jobs or crit for critical, um, you'd say, you know, parts of their economy to China. You know, you know, I, 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 I live in England. I've lived here for, for, for 20 odd years. I walk into the store I used to and I would pick up a piece of, of meat and I would see shipping in from New Zealand. And I, and I never understood in Wales, just across, there, 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 there are millions of sheep. How can you um, rear a sheep, kill a sheep, then you do all the logistics, then you ship it thousands of, of kilometers, and then you, you can distribute it, you unpack it, you distribute it, and you stack it on the shelves, and it's still cheaper. It means that something is fundamentally important with the macroeconomic structure that is being led by the multilateral trade agreements that these institutions, um, these countries have signed up to. And I would remind you about, um, you know, the, 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 the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that they were trying to pass into law in Europe would have made even that, these monstrosities even bigger, less power to the people, less localization of, of production of your food. This is a, a very toxic form of economics that I believe should be readily identified as the primary cause for the issues that we're experiencing in the world today. And world order, there is a world order already. It's called the BRICS Plus. The Russians have already launched successfully a gold-backed ruble. And the rest of the world want a piece of the cake because the rest of the world have sniffed out the lie um, that you cannot advance your economy with a petrodollar fiat model. You need at the core of it, something that is real, that is a real measure of your work, of your effort. Gold, you have to drill for it, you have to dig for it. It takes effort and time. They want to make something they print the same as gold, which is a real measure of effort. If so, if I'm drilling for my resources and you can come to me with a suitcase that you've printed on a machine, how can that be fair? So the new reality of the BRICS is by its nature introducing sovereignty because it's, it's essentially rooting with strong monetary, you know, long lasting real economics, not the modern monetary theory that, you know, you know the fake economists like Professor and Joseph Spitzer and um, you know Paul, you know Krugman and these people. They, these are prophets of. Um, they, they speak about a system that doesn't work. It's 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 a it's a deception. The real value of your effort should be trapped in something that cannot be artificially manipulated, like the creation of currency, which is the sole reason the wealth is shifting from the resource-rich nations to the nations that control the monetary system and these individuals are not working for their money they are artificially extracting all of it out of africa and the rest of the world to enrich themselves and these entities as as you know these bureaucracies they're offshore they have no their god is themselves and they have no interest in the world coming together through a monetary economic system that is going to art automatically allow the wealth of the countries to rise as a function of their resources and their efforts and introducing as professor mentioned earlier about we get a piece of the pie we get a piece of the wealth this is what has been missing from the the, the current system so the new paradigm that we're moving into and i'm closing here in this part it is a more egalitarian kind of paradigm that will give each nation control over its wealth. This is sovereignty. And this monetary sovereignty, with it comes freedom. Because as long as I can control my pocket, and then the taxman isn't coming or somebody coming, picking up with a gun and taking my wealth away from me, which has been happening, utilizing this, this petrol um, dollar system, and people, it's been operating on the stealth, it's been exposed, people are rejecting it, and we're moving into a better reality. Thank you. Better coming about uh, again to sovereignty, and of course, uh, it's uh, it's an underlining factor uh, when it comes to the principles of uh, the United Nations 
preaching sovereignty. How can uh, nations remain sovereign and, of course, ensure uh, right uh, or positive cooperation? Uh, uh, coming to you, Yulia Berger, uh, in your capacity as a political uh, and legal scientist, let's look at how uh, uh, the world can uh, ensure more of a, a global cooperation instead of global uh, domination, as you rightly said, and, and how can they do this uh, without violating the, the autonomy or the sovereignty of, uh, of our nations, especially when it comes to, to, to countries in Africa, uh, like, a, like some pundits hold that uh, the crisis or the turbulent nature, uh, nature of African nations in contemporary society is because of an increase uh, of uh, the geopolitical game or the quest uh, by other powers to curve the sphere of influence and that's what uh, Mr. Ellis just pointed out right now using the gun to control your resources but then uh, let's look at it polit politically since we cannot dissociate uh, or separate ourselves from the politics how can we cooperate without actually infringing the, the sovereignty or autonomy of states you know, um, what I'm going to say right now might sound a bit controversial, but I um, would like to throw this idea in just for some reflection on this point, right? So we have, at the moment, the global population of around 8 billion people. That's quite a lot. And this number has been growing lately, right? Um, out of those 8 billion people, um, around 1.5 billion are living in China, 1.5 billion almost are living in India, a bit less than in China, around 1.4 billion of people live in Africa. So if we take India, China and Africa combined, that would be the majority of uh, the global population. So if we use our favorite term democracy here, meaning the rule of majority, that would mean that uh, the African Union countries, India and China combined do have that majority and they have, you know, in, in terms of the majority democratic rights, they have the right to set the uh, agenda for the global population of 8 billion because they represent the majority of that population if they came to sort of an agreement. But neither China nor India nor Africa or any, you know, any country in Africa, uh, they have never had an ambition or um, audacity to say that they are setting the global agenda for everyone to follow. The uh, arrogance or enough arrogance for this and enough audacity for that has been demonstrated by some modern day politicians from the United States, from the European Union, who've heard what, what Blinken was saying, that the world would um, get into chaos if the United States were not dominating it and setting the rules and regulations. We heard um, the, the Borrell from the European Union saying that Europe is a beautiful garden and everything else is a jungle, and the jungle is trying to get into the garden, right? We all heard that. And, you know, the, the way um, the global politics have been structured lately makes, and this is the uh, controversial um, statement that I'm going to make, uh, because I'm, I also felt being um, a part of, you know, the, this process. Um, a lot of global, or maybe the majority of global population has this inferiority complex towards the West. Why do we, from people from Russia, people from Eastern Europe, people from... Um, Africa, from India, from China, from Arabic countries, why do we all think that the West is somehow better? Look where it's going to, look at the values, look at what they're trying to build, look at how they're trying to build what they, how, how they have been building, what they have. Why do we have this inferiority complex? Why not, don't we dare to set our own agenda, at least in our own countries. Because like I said, you know, not too many actors globally, not too many countries have been having this arrogance and audacity to be dictating the rules for everyone and setting those universal so-called standards. Why do we uh, associate uh, um, the, the world heritage in terms of arts, in terms of uh, 
you know, education and culture, uh, mostly with the Western countries. I mean, look at all the uh, achievements that uh, uh, the countries in the East have in terms of philosophy, in terms of amazing masterpieces. You look at some Indian temples that were built thousands of years ago, and you, you, you're you left there amazed. Why don't we talk about the heritage of the African countries? Why is the history being rewritten? And we do allow that to happen, to say that before colonization, there was nothing in Africa. There were, you know, just tribes circulating and, and fighting with each other. That is not true. And that is definitely not the narrative we need to overcome this inferiority complex. And I mean, it's it's very much the same in Russia. When someone from uh, the West comes here and, you know, if people move to Russia, they're being, by, by Russians themselves, they're being asked, what are you doing here? Why did you uh, choose to change your beautiful uh, United States of America or any country of the uh, European Union for Russia. People would be expressing their own inferiority complex in any conversation of the kind. Even what you see happening at the uh, level of global politics right now and what has been happening for, for the last you know decades in terms of the uh, relations with Russia is that this, uh, let's say, victim position was being uh, consciously or not, but it was being supported by many. So going back to the issues of um, global cooperation, again, when we use the term democracy, sometimes we tend to forget that the origin of democracy as it was in ancient Greece did not imply participation of everyone. There were the noblemen, males who had military training who could vote and, and be elected and participate in those processes, Female slaves and non-noble people uh, were not considered citizens, so it was not, you know, a, uh, a regime that was good for everyone living there, but it was dividing people into categories. And it's not a clocracy that we're talking about the rule of mob, right, uh, when we are uh, trying to use those terms for an inclusive type of a regime that allows all of the citizens to take part in decision-making processes. But again, you know, if we are using the term of democracy for a global cooperation, a coalition of India, China, and Africa would be enough to set the standards for everybody else because, well, that's the majority rule accepted. That's what we keep uh, hearing. Um, so in my opinion, uh, overcoming this inferiority complex and um, allowing ourselves to be the masters of our destiny at the personal level, at the level of our communities, at the level of the countries, and at the level of establishing the rules of cooperation is essential. Look what's happening now. Um, Iran and Russia, if they're having some type of joint production of weapons like drones, uh, uh, that puts Iran under even more pressure from the United States. They're claiming that they will put additional sanctions as if the ones existing are not enough and this and that and whatsoever because they admit that uh, Iran is a part to the conflict in Ukraine. So the countries supplying uh, Ukraine, which is, you know, most of the European countries, most of, uh, um, you know, the, the countries under the, uh, the, the, um, um, the rule of the, the current king of uh, <laughs> the United Kingdom, I mean, Australia, Canada, and everybody else uh, supporting Ukraine and supplying weapons and this, that, they are not considered a party to the conflict. But if there is a joint production of drones by Russia and Iran, it is enough to consider Iran a party to the conflict. So this is quite, uh, you know, crazy in terms of the uh, double standards that we have been observing. Yet at the same time, key to this is just to say, you know, I'm out of this and I'm making my own decisions. This is what some of the BRICS plus countries are trying to do. And we will see how this will be developing. But my hope is that uh, people would come to realize that regardless of what they are and regardless of the origin, they do have the right to, provide, to protect their values if they're constructive. They do have the right to... Uh, have their say without excusing themselves.
Thank you, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, let me uh, continue with you, uh, Professor Chatish. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, BRICS nation. Of course, we're also talking about uh, the United Nations and NATO uh, taking uh, a clear example of uh, uh, the NATO's involvement uh, in uh, the war between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. And of course, some pundit, uh, even uh, uh, civil society have expressed concern uh, uh, highlighting or pinpointing that uh, the United Nations and NATO these two bodies have, have largely helped to aggravate uh, the uh, situation of the world especially uh, undermining the peace and stability what is your perspective about it is there a, a, an iota of truth in the narratives or uh, there is another uh, understanding of this if that be the case what can NATO and the US do in this context Temporary society is that the lapses eh, of the organization have been uh, exposed to the uh, or brought to the fore. What needs to be done to to to, to change the paradigm, uh, like uh, Mr. Ellis earlier uh, underlined? Thank you, thank you, madam. Uh, <clears throat> in my view, it's very easy to blame an institution like United Nations for everything that why they are not able to bring peace. Now, when the whole world is uh, uh, into a mode of expansionism through military and technological means and uh, trying to grab a piece of land, and uh, we want you and to bring peace at land. So, I mean, this is uh, something, if you and had not been there, perhaps things would have been still worse over there. So, we should not blame you and at least. Yeah. The alliances like NATO and others, they have their own political agenda and uh, ruled by certain superpowers only, and they act accordingly. Uh, but there, there is a slight shift taking place. And uh, this is a part of the transformation that the world is going from unipolar to multipolar society. And uh, if you if you have seen, now European Union, they are trying to build their own agenda and they are not uh, just blindly supporting uh, whatever uh, USA says. So there is a slight shift. Yes, it will take some time, but uh, uh, it, it is a process. And uh, once you lose your leadership position, then you require support from others. And that is what is happening into uh, building up so many new partnerships and alliances. Uh, like Quaid, our office, or uh, others, as you see. So there is much scope for emerging uh, nations, as Julia Madam said, India, China, and Africa uh, being a majority of the population, to stake their claim. And uh, as Julia Madam said, uh, we have to come out of that complex of inferiority. Uh, I have been to attend BRICS conference and other global conferences at Moscow a number of times. And I am I was also surprised uh, why people, uh, young students, they should be uh, crazy for McDonald's only. Why not their own uh, uh, snacks? Or crazy to see Hollywood pictures only. It's, it's a kind of a reflection of a complex you have that West is better. So, uh, uh, as it is said uh, by John Maxwell, that uh, once you are good inside, sooner or later, you will be great outside. I would repeat, once you are good inside, sooner or later, you will become great outside also. And that is what is to be followed by each nation, each society. As uh, Dr. A.D. Uh, pointed out, that uh, 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 we have to sort out our own internal differences, internal struggles that we are having in almost every country between different communities, societies, etc. Then only we can blame uh, some war uh, as the evil for all the problems. As uh, Clifton sir said, uh, this Russia-Ukraine war is now being taken as an excuse for all, all the deficiencies of our political systems. Earlier, uh, before that, uh, it was a COVID pandemic. But I think the biggest, deadliest ongoing pandemic is poverty, is unemployment. 
this is the these are the biggest pandemics that have been going on and we need to concentrate uh, on that in our own way we have to develop uh, our own systems uh, it's a sort of uh, i would like to say globalization globalization where uh, your vision is global you take whatever is best practice from the globe but you act locally your policies are for your uh, locally without uh, harming interest of neighbors or any anyone else so that that is the best way possible uh, in the given scenario as uh, uh, eddie sir uh, had pointed out that uh, we cannot blame that uh, so many things are happening in tigray in ethiopia and mali and congo mm. everywhere how can we blame some external powers for that and the biggest thing is that this uh, the so much emphasis is being given on military strength uh, on accumulating weapons and uh, diverting all the uh, important resources to buy uh, weapons and nuclear building nuclear arms that is the biggest problem and uh, we need to divert some of these funds from defense to education and healthcare in each society and uh, that will be helpful in bringing otherwise uh, defense becomes the uh, national security becomes the first priority but people security gets lost so uh, that is what every nation has to uh, see and we cannot allow uh, as eddie sir pointed out one nation to veto what what all other 180 nations are saying so uh, that restructuring a realignment of uh, forces rebalancing of even that is important i agree with that thank you Professor, indeed, uh, in every uh, unfortunate uh, situation, uh, there is always a reason, there is always an advantage. Uh, uh, we come to you, Dr. A.D., we talk now in the perspective uh, of uh, an African. Uh, you mentioned earlier on, of course, the African economies uh, are suffering the ripple effect of uh, the Ukrainian war, and it becomes worrisome that a sovereign independent state uh, can be disaffected uh, today all over the world as inflation and the population is in dire need uh, of course let's come now uh, like uh, uh, how can uh, african nations or african uh, stakeholders especially policy makers across africa uh, take the advantages uh, of uh, this situation uh, that is happening across the world to chat or to redefine a new uh, a new economic policies that will best uh, suit uh, the the, the present context or uh, actually help Africa because we know uh, that the, the, the development agenda 2063 uh, that of course is well defined and articulated there now how can this be a success uh, or uh, uh, come to reality when there are no strong economic policies that can back up uh, every dream of Africans so what uh, what can we do we know like I said the lapses, the coming of COVID-19 uh, uh, expose uh, the, the vulnerability or the weaknesses of the health sector uh, across Africa. And now we see the Ukrainian crisis affecting economies also in Africa. So what can be done practically across uh, by stakeholders in Africa, especially political leaders, to ensure that uh, this doesn't happen in the nearest future? The first thing I want to say is that, you know, the civil society in Africa, uh, civil society organizations, needs to uh, pressure the African government to change the narrative. Again, I find it very offensive for an African leader like Macky Sall to uh, make a comment, uh, travel even to Russia uh, to negotiate, you know, with the release of uh, wheat production because it is impacting food production uh, uh, and consumption in Africa, for instance. When you know that, you know, where people in Senegal, you know, were eat the jollof rice, you know, were profusely. When you know that, you know, where in some countries in West Africa, people rely on uh, 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 plantains, for instance, it is clear that, you know, where the African head of state today, uh, once again, you know, were put to the task of reinventing or re-strategizing or restructuring the economies. Number one, the uh, South-South cooperation 
here's another opportunity again. We talked about that, you know, about, you know, a decade ago when the BRICS countries, you know, were re-emerged uh, more strongly and countries like, you know, India and uh, uh, Brazil, I want to name these two in and here particularly, amplified and multiplied their cooperation with African countries. At one point under President you know, Ignacio Lula of Brazil, Brazil was the country that had the most diplomatic uh, relationship with African countries in the world, surpassing even countries from Europe and the United States or North American countries. It means what it means. It was exchanges in terms of construction, in terms of agriculture. When it comes to India, India revamped around that time a very decade or multiple decades, you know, were old uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration with African countries by allowing, actually creating channels, facilitating number of African students to attend the universities in India. Bangalore University comes to mind because two of my younger brothers, actually my baby brothers, went to that country to study. This is also aspect of a South-South uh, cooperation. We also know at one point, even before COVID-19, when uh, the uh, medicine crisis, and this was something in the late 1990s, early 2000s, but generic medicine from India became the panacea or the solution for many African countries because of the pattern issue that, you know, uh, uh, Clifton, you know, what mentioned earlier when it comes to the uh, World Trade Organization and the issue of patents, for instance. So the South-South cooperation is one thing. The second solution I want to uh, uh, emphasize it in here is that the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreements that uh, the African countries are working on. Many have ratified that, and then they are, of course, you know, we're working on the different mechanisms to date. And I believe that this is going to offer the uh, African continent uh, creating the largest market in the world, uh, making sure that you know where you have a uh, multiplied and more meaningful trade agreement and cooperation between uh, the African countries in terms of uh, cooperation. Clarice, this is uh, bringing us to another thing. Today, when you look at countries like uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, cocoa is uh, the king of crops. But we know the conditions in which those are two crops you know, are produced. We know the unfair prices that the producers are getting. What is being done? Do we change that economic pattern and uh, come back to, I'm happy to see that a country like Nigeria has uh, uh, started to uh, initiate actually a diversification of its economy from oil to emphasize a little bit more of agriculture because it will be a continuum to be pointless to have all this oil production, but at the same time, spending a lot of the revenues from the oil production on food consumption or food uh, 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 imports. The other thing I want to mention is that the African workers. Um, Professor Jack Bishop from uh, India told us and reminded us that you know what Africa has, or will have actually already has, the largest pool of young people, workers, People in a working, uh, working age people, whether they are male or female, how do we tap into that resource? How do we make sure effectively that they are trained, properly trained, adequately to match the realities of today, maybe in the agricultural sector or in the emerging digital sector to capture and harness this energy for Africa, you know, what to position itself, it is a key. And then... COVID-19 came. We all know what happened. If you remember, the African uh, leaders at the uh, UN, at the UN, at the AU, or even at the um, the different, you know, sub-regional groupings, uh, made the clear decision that they should be able in the nearest future for Africa to produce its own medicine. It is a commitment. How do we make sure that, you know, they uphold that commitment and invest in what they need to invest. Yes, it is a beautiful commitment, but at the same time, we are skeptical. Why? Because in 2001, in the case of ECOWAS, for instance, in West Africa, the countries decided to invest at least 16% of their annual revenues in 
health infrastructure. From 2001 till today, none of the 16 or 15 countries members of the ECOWAS have met that threshold. Many other things, of course, you know, were done to improve health uh, 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 healthcare uh, structures. Yes, but this was not met. And then finally, the food policy. We cannot continue to blame the war on Ukraine for the food prices in Africa or in many Africa, especially in the rainforest areas where you have massive amount of land and then we are not producing enough of food for direct and internal consumption. And very finally, in and here, what the African leaders or the African countries need to do, we need to find a way to resolve all these internal conflicts that are actually creating havoc or wrecking havoc on our nations. We need to find a solution to that. Maybe that is the way to encourage what is being done by local authorities to make sure that constitutions are not being amended unconstitutionally to create problems. Elections are held peacefully without people uh, shedding their blood or dying. And that uh, policies, uh, dissent uh, are not uh, contained uh, with uh, violence, but people are listened to. That digital autocracy is not on the verge or on the right, uh, but uh, control, uh, means, let's say control, let's say uh, people are free to speak. These are the things that, you know, internally, the African continent can do, uh, the African countries can do, to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, they strengthen peace and stability mechanism they ensure more peace in those countries, which will facilitate a better movement of a people, of a culture, of goods, of cooperation. This strength will position the continent uh, to better deal with its external partners like India and others and Turkey. And finally, have the pressure we believe they can have at the global stage when it comes to the United Nations, for instance. But as long as we continue to be weak that way, we continue to have this weak institution, this weak monetary systems that for some of them are even still dependent on the former colonial power. I think we will have been again trading so many things that we need, right, to address the issues of today. Clarice, this is my father word on that. Thank you. Then I will stay with you while talking. You touch a very uh, important aspect, the place of the young people in Africa. And of course, we know that the uh, African Union in uh, its agenda 2063 touched this very important uh, aspect to skill development. But then let's look at the place of the young people uh, regarding our topic for today, which is uh, global cooperation. And of course, we know that when countries cooperate well, there is room for investment investment then what how uh, ready are, are young africans or the uh, youth in africa to make good use of the opportunities uh, that are uh, present uh, as a, as a result of this global cooperation how ready are they to understand uh, the, the politics around the world to ensure that the better stand well and and take uh, probably uh, the, the, these opportunities like earlier mentioned uh, to to fast track development in uh, the political sphere, economic sphere, and of course the social sphere? We can say that uh, there is a, I don't want to say skeptical, but there is a greater hope. It is true that today uh, for some of the youth, uh, the uh, way they're being uh, bombarded by uh, the uh, unilateral flow of information, especially from uh, the uh, countries of Europe and North America or from the Western civilization into Africa can be problematic. Why do I say this? When we continue to see the number of young people ready to reach their lives to cross the Mediterranean, to cross the desert and uh, 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 embark on migration corridors uh, all over the world. Today, Clarice, we all know that, you know, uh, the uh, North uh, uh, Africa the uh, desert, the uh, uh, Mediterranean is not the only channel. We also have uh, people who are crossing into North America from uh, Mexico, following the channel from all the way Chile. How do they do that? You know, I mean, it is left uh, for us uh, to imagine. There is a true potential that can be honest, for sure. 
this great responsibility today, I am going to make it a fall on the shoulders of our governments, African governments, with their policies that they put in place. I believe that the more hope we instigate in the lives of these younger people to understand that the African continent can offer much more than what they believe they can have, it will reduce and, uh, of course, rejuvenate these young people. Second thing, as I said earlier, we all agree, a well-trained youth, a well-trained youth is a potential for economic development. It is a potential for a good, responsible workforce that understands the ins and outs of a decent work in the world arena. To the point that even when they travel outside of their respective sphere of uh, uh, belonging, let's say, their countries, wherever they find themselves, they are capable of contributing to this world economy. Training, therefore, is a, 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 a key uh, in India. That investment cannot come from an impoverished youth already. Let's take the example of a digital platform today. And that will be my final word on that. We find out that, you know what, in Nigeria, uh, South Africa, and uh, uh, Zambia, those countries have witnessed a booming platform economy where young people, understanding that they cannot work in uh, the traditional jobs, are actually driving younger are driving, you know, Uber, are driving this, are creating their own distribution companies. Let us also see what is happening with the YouTube economy, as I call it. How many people are making money today using TikTok, using YouTube, posting stuff, right? This is a huge thing that exists today in Africa that, you know, we can definitely be uh, banked on. But again, the key responsibility falls on the shoulders of this African government. Number one, the educational system. How do we make them adequate? Number two, how do we make sure that we create investments, job opportunities, uh, what you call it, uh, 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 possibilities for them to create their own businesses, for instance, in those countries? How many African countries are ready to actually provide systematically without going through some political or politicized channels, ways for young people to have access to loans. To have access to loans. These are things that do not exist. Only people who work in the formal sectors can have access to a loan because they have a regular salary that comes in in there. Whereas we know that Africa leads the world in terms of the informal economy. These are all the things that, you know, what the African leaders need to understand because those young people, young female and male who work are actually in this uh, informal sector uh, economy. Thank you. As uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, tensions increase among nations uh, around the world, uh, we come uh, to you, uh, Professor Jack Deja. Uh, we continue to look at how to solve uh, the common problem uh, faced by the global world, uh, how we can uh, uh, give uh, a common solution to it. Let's look at uh, problems around uh, the uh, uh, balance or lines of balance of power and uh, uh, global institutional design can 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 we bring some uh, uh, constructive talk around this two areas uh, which are very imperative in uh, today's uh, world yeah thank you thank you very much madam uh, you see uh, as we all know with the uh, current situation supply chain disruption is one thing that is affecting almost the entire world and especially in the South countries. So there is a scope for regionalization. I mean, uh, within region, people should, uh, the countries should unite and form their own supply chains as well as markets and utilize each other's uh, talents also, rather than depending upon something from West, like uh, BRICS uh, should become more powerful now uh, in the given situation, uh, uh, the kind of uh, population they represent, uh, like uh, Russia, 
uh, help can help in uh, uh, food supply in energy supply to to the entire regions and uh, india can help in talent development education and so many other fields pharma etc so uh, let us see what what who can do what for each other uh, at the uh, global level as well as within the region i mean within africa if nigeria south africa brazil they are ahead of others they should also uh, try to help their uh, less fortunate uh, nations uh, people uh, with their technology with uh, digitalization with education in any way or uh, by funding uh, their projects like uh, you have a uh, platform called nepad new partnership for african development i mean these such kind of uh, uh, organizations they need to be strengthened for mutual cooperation and collaboration also uh, another thing is that uh, africa should take uh, africa is so rich of its uh, mineral resources you have uh, more than 90% of world cobalt comes from there more than 50% of gold 80% of platinum uh, uranium diamond phosphate manganese and so many things africa is so rich so uh, the governments there should try to uh, utilize this rich resources into employment generation also and uplifting the economy so at global level uh, i think uh, all the nations who who are emerging and who want change uh, in this uh, present global order they need to support each other at the global level uh, not only in case of problems but also at institutions like world bank imf or uno uh, security council or any other place we need to support each other uh, even if there are slight differences of opinions of ideologies between uh, nations but seeing the overall scenario it becomes imperative for each nation to forget the differences and look at the similarities similarities of uh, culture of uh, uh, people's aspirations and similarity of problems also so uh, i think uh, that way we can build a mechanism of uh, cooperation and collaboration among the uh, world that's my say Uh, uh, coming to you, Yulia Berger. Let's look. Let's look at. Uh, of course, uh, we're almost culminating, but then uh, we still have some few minutes to talk. Uh, uh, let's look at uh, the uh, BRICS nation, uh, and of course, uh, uh, in line with what Professor just said, uh, uh, working, taking the positive aspect of globalization to fresh track development in our respective uh, nations. Uh, it's true we cannot uh, uh, dissociate ourselves from each other. Even If we talking about global cooperation today is because we need each other in order to bring us uh, solutions to uh, the many problems faced uh, or the common problems faced by the the global world so uh, 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 brick uh, nations of course have always uh, uh, in one of their their meetings talk about the uh, uh, ensuring and supporting uh, the development of uh, the nations uh, of uh, nations of of bricks so in your perspective uh, what can be done dear yulia to 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 change the narratives there uh, i want us to look at how we can change the narratives from the uh, geoeconomics uh, uh, making it not to be something sort of a personal strategy but of course on lines of improving uh, the uh, uh, economies or uh, the economies of uh, uh, various nations thank you for the question um well personally i i think that this is one of the key questions we should all be discussing right now because there is um so much of criticism so much of people analyzing and going deep and talking about what's wrong but not too many people are trying to focus on what an alternative could be right so in march this year um having these thoughts in my head and trying to wrap my head around all those things happening um you know globally um i started a project called uh, globus in order to discuss some of the uh, constructive aspects what could the world look like 
And we've been having um, discussions with experts uh, dedicated to different topics. We were trying to see uh, what the alternatives could be, what the key issues are, how we can go around those. And, you know, um, a conclusion that I came to uh, as a result of those discussions is that we should definitely be thinking of a uh, holistic approach to this. You know, like um, when you talk about healthcare and when you talk about, you know, health, generally speaking, you have uh, some, this, this is going to be quite a vivid illustration. So you have, for instance, the uh, Chinese and Indian tradition, when you come to a doctor and the, talk, the doctor talks to you about your lifestyle, this and that, and you say, well, I have a headache. And the doctor says, well, you need to change your lifestyle first. You need to make sure that you eat healthy. You need to uh, make sure that you have enough of fresh air, that you exercise and this and that. So that's a holistic approach. When you come to a doctor in, in what, what is called, you know, modern uh, facilities and hospitals, uh, they tell you, okay, here is a prescription, uh, take the pill, take the pills. And when you have uh, side effects and other symptoms kicking in, you know, come back and I'll give you some more pills and, you know, good luck with that. So that is the key difference. We identify so many problems. We talk about them a lot, but those are symptoms. And what is actually wrong is, is at the core uh, of, I think, you know, our approaches and value systems. And this is something we need to focus on first right because everything else emanates from that um so i think that um those discussions dedicated to you know constructive approaches the actual values we really want to stand for um are key in this sense and if we uh, somewhat agree that what we're trying to do here is to evolve and continue, you know, the life um, on the planet. Um, if we really agree to do so, this should be uh, reflected in our actions. And um, we talk a lot about politicians and ruling, uh, you know, people who run the countries and the so-called ruling class. We can be calling it whatever, the elites and whatsoever else. But we really do underestimate the power of each individual right and once an individual makes a decision to pursue a certain you know path and a certain value set um everything changes around that individual as well and the more we have um you know people like that the more we talk about it the more we really try to find approaches um to make that happen uh, the better it will be getting because what is happening in the world right now, uh, we can, you know, blame it on anyone uh, forever, but we are also taking part in that. We are allowing that to happen. Each and every one of us is allowing that to happen by giving our attention to uh, something that we do consider maybe wrong, you know, but we do pay attention to that and we do vote for it with our, you know, energy, attention and money and everything else. So, you know, um, like um, Gandhi was, you know, uh, saying uh, a different type of an approach is to be used. And, you know, his non-violential um, approach and simple boycotting um, was actually functioning. Um, it was slower, of course, it was slower, but it was deeper. And so the results were more sustainable. So I think the, the key is this, but I mean, we've had enough time uh, to observe and to try to make our own conclusions. And it looks like, you know, given the fact that we really are somewhere at the beginning of the third, third um, uh, World War, or uh, World War Three, uh, it really feels like if we do not understand it in, um, in a good way, so-called, there would have to be something almost catastrophic happening in order to shake, you know, the unnecessary things off our heads and minds and souls and everything else. I'm really hoping that this would not be the case, but you know, sometimes it feels like something extraordinary would have to happen for, um, for people to realize where we have been going to and what we have been allowing to happen.
happen uh, we are going to end uh, the program with uh, mr Liz. Uh, let's come to, again now uh, to know uh, listening to the analysis so far and of course uh, one of the speakers underlined that indeed uh, that this uh, new world order that leaders or stakeholders policy makers are trying to build is already on the move but then let's look at it uh, this international cooperation we are talking about today cannot actually go further if there is no compromise. So with the new order already in place, and what do you think huh, uh, these stakeholders, uh, those at the fore, uh, need to compromise to bring back uh, the world to where it was before and mitigate all of uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the effects, especially uh, the economic effects that the global world is facing in a contemporary society? Thanks, Clarice, and thanks, uh, thanks to the other speakers for sharing your ideas on how we could constructively participate in, in putting forward ideas to, to, as a humanity to shift us forward. And I want to go back um, to some of the points made by Professor um, Jagdish, Catherine. Um, you know, Rumi says that um, yesterday I was clever, I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I want to change myself, right? The question is how? Because the value system that we incorporate within ourselves will determine what we agree to and what we disagree to as a collective. So we have to first and foremost concentrate on what value system do we actually want to see in our society? Do we want honesty? Do we want integrity? Do we want people around us that are prosperous? Um, they have all the basic and fundamental and beyond um, needs and wants to manifest them, you know, their their highest potential as an individual, and prevent, you know, the exodus of African young talent from leaving the continent. When I think about values, I think about, um, you know, why it is that. Africans and the rest of the world have an inferiority complex as it pertains to lacking the confidence to take our destiny, destinies into our own hands. And that is because you had a battle going on between communism, the ideology, and capitalism. And the world coming out of World War II became, uh, you know, became, I guess, after the Russian Revolution, it became um, these two schools of thoughts. The Reds versus the capitalists were and, and they then latched on capitalism to freedom. So the marketing strategy that they used to proliferate the idea was that capitalism that brought wealth, it also brought freedom. And so this idea, so then that idea was hijacked by the globalists who then decided to change capitalism, which is really allowing organically for the markets to express themselves in a way that does not is not impeded by bureaucracy and red tape and that bureaucracy is what is called the military industrial complex and the banking system because they determine where the money goes and where the investments are made by creating the legislative and regulatory environment to facilitate their agenda and so the question is as we move away from that paradigm into this new paradigm, the question becomes, what values do we want to have? First, I feel that the state has taken away the responsibility of the individual, control over our children, control over our environment, control over, even over our bodies, where they have made us into numbers, and things and so we are we need to go back to where we are individual and we are individually sovereign so we take back control over our bodies we take control over our speech we take control over our institutions we take control over our wealth and our resources and we say no and if you remember Trump's speech in Davos and in the UN he says this era is not for the globalists. And I believe he's talking about 
free men and free women is is key. The granularity where he took it was to individual sovereignty. And this individual sovereignty needs to be expressed through a set of values. And this is where we talk about the Bill of Rights and the amendments, freedom of speech, and the rights to bear arms. Because if we go back to the revolutionary period, when they were speaking about the ideas of individual governing themselves that we never had before in history, they talked about the government should never, or the people should never fear the government, and gave the people the ammunition to defend their freedom. And Jefferson saying that the tree of freedom is watered by blood. It's unfortunate that this is the case, but it is the case. Because those who would make themselves autocratic and to govern over us and to give themselves the, the right to, do, to rule because of divinity or whatever they perceive themselves, they have by stealth taken away our freedoms. So the value becomes freedom. How do we express this? We are individuals. My family and their prosperity of my community is important. If I, as, the, as my brother Jack just says, if another country is impoverished, let us take care of that country because they're part of the human body. Humanity is one. They've tried to break us down into different groups. The more groups they make is the more divided we become. And unity is in our strength. So by creating a, a, an environment in which we're all arguing with each other about things, we're, they're, behind the scenes, they're taking our wealth, they're taking our power. So we need to facilitate conversations about the values that will give us freedom, that will give us the, the, the authority to govern sovereignly in, in our lives. So I want to just put, leave that thought out there in closing. At least, uh, thank you uh, to say that, that uh, the, there is need for a paradigm shift uh, as far as uh, global cooperation is concerned in this uh, uh, present uh, day society where we can talk sovereignty, where we can talk credibility, where we can talk uh, viability uh, and of course sustainability as uh, underlined earlier by uh, Dr. Eddie and of course I take this opportunity now to say thank you to all the uh, great panel for the great insight uh, on our topic for today uh, and thank you for making our time uh, to be with the Pan-African Television and to educate the world especially the African continent especially uh, uh, young people who are just engaging into the political sphere on how they can uh, uh, define uh, the, the new perspective or bring in new perspective or impetus into the uh, global cooperation that will see the countries of the world enjoy the endowment of course in terms of natural resources and of course will live the dream of seeing a fulfilled humanity thank you again for respecting and honoring the rendezvous and wish you a blissful weekend at your respective ends i'll take this opportunity to say bye-bye without forgetting the technical crew for ensuring a smooth run of the program do have a nice time in the company of our transmissions and bye thank you Clarence. thank you very much